Good, good, good go. All right, praise God. Uh, good morning again. Welcome to the Narrowgate Bible Church. Uh, it is the uh, April 26, 2020, and nobody ever thought that uh, by this time in 2020, the whole world would be on lockdown um, over a kind of a um, extreme flu, I guess. I don't know. Um, you know, something like that, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of disturbed. I really need a haircut. I mean, this is horrible. I'm about to get some clippers and have my wife just go to town. But uh, I want to share this with you all this morning because it's, it's just uh, something that's been such a blessing and an encouragement to me. Um, April 25th, 2012, 2013, sorry, I was released from the county jail um, with... Uh, one year of drug court, five years probation. Now, the month of June in 2012, five times I went to four different hospitals that month because I was dying. I kept finding myself buckled over on the floor in pain. Something was wrong right here, and I didn't know what it was. Well, the last hospital took it serious, and they uh, took me in and put me under. And they uh, were just really, actually, honestly, waiting for me to expire. They were just waiting for me to die. Um, a week later, when I actually came to and came out of it, because my levels were so high, they came down, uh, they diagnosed me with cirrhosis, liver, gallstone, hep C, jaundice, and I had a right front inguinal hernia that I had from 2010. Uh, so pretty much um, everybody and their mother, if you will, came to see me. Social services came, said, you know, we need to get you on disability. Um, all kinds of people came and said, you need to come down and see us. So, I mean, pretty much I was dying. And a week later, there I was with a needle in my arm one more time, uh, shooting meth. It's kicked it off, and uh, I was doing meth and heroin. It was just bad. That was my life that I lived. Even that close to death. And again, there was a guy came down the hall as I was in, the, the, in recovery, and he came down to see another guy that was right there, and he had a Bible. And once again, there it was, and I had asked him, can I have one of those, please? You know, 21 years in and out of jail, I knew what a Bible was. <laughs> I actually knew kind of who Jesus was, too, but I didn't personally know him. Um, not until about five months later, uh, when I got arrested, November 26, for robbing a pool house that was in the back of a house that was, nobody lived there, uh, but there was a lot of stuff left there, and the cops caught us, and I went to jail. And I had, uh, in my hardened, obstinate, stubborn heart, I was just whatever, hey, I'm dying, they're going to go easy on me, and they didn't. I was looking at five to 20 years in prison, but you know who did? God, through his grace and mercy, saved me two weeks into it, and for the first time in my life, I, was, I wept because I had realized that I was a sinner, and I had realized that I was in the presence of a holy God, and that because of my sin, I was doomed and headed straight to hell. And God, by His Spirit, uh, revealed that to me and saved me through Jesus Christ, His Son. And now, seven years later, uh, you know, here we are. So just praise God. Um, it's just always an encouraging story. I don't look back to rehash the past. I look back to glorify God. So I wanted to share that with, with you all. And not only that, who would have known several years later that my wife's birthday is on April 30th? You know, so like five days after that, we get to celebrate her birthday. So what was that, Deb, you were going to say? And he also healed me, um, you know, going to the doctors and stuff. Ten months after being out of jail, well, three months, I got plugged in with Pastor Billy at Sunrise Bible Church and became part of the internship. We started an internship there. Ten months later, I went to the doctor and he took ten vials of blood from me and, and um, two weeks later went back and he was just wasn't sure what to do. There were no traces of hep C, no traces of anything in my blood of cirrhosis. I mean, look, God, God had healed me. And I don't want to call it a miracle. I want to call it God's sovereignty, His divine grace. I mean, if He wouldn't have healed me, it is what it is. You know, if I live, I live for Jesus. If I die, I die for Jesus. It doesn't matter. But He had grace on me and decided to heal me of, of all that. And today, you know, by His grace, I'm healthy. In fact, the first thing I did was I, now I had to work because I wasn't going to get disability. So, you know, that was kind of one of those things, 16,000 disability or uh, nothing, but everything because I got Christ. So, you know what I did? I went and got a, uh, a health card and I started working with food, something I thought I would never be able to do because of hep C. There were no traces. 
I, I passed for a health card, got me a job at Taco Bell. So anyway, uh, God took it from there and really has done some wonderful things. We're just glad to be here. And I just wanted to kind of share that with you all. One of these days, I'll, you know, maybe Lord willing, um, give a little more of my testimony. But that the main thing is for the glory of God. That is why he saves us for himself, for his glory. He does it because he's God. And that's all. But uh, we're going to continue in our study uh, prophecy study, a great study, by the way, and looking at who is Jesus, because, you know, there's a lot of people that claim to know Jesus, but really don't know who he is. They don't really know him. And the main thing, when it all comes down, is does Jesus know you? So, <clears throat> ah, we are going to continue in this study, but let's go ahead and let's pray. Uh, Father, we're so grateful and thankful for your, your sovereignty, God, for your grace, for your mercy, Lord. Because if not for that, none of us would be here today. None of us would have ever been saved. God, you saved us according to your uh, eternal plan and for your will only, God, that you would be glorified by it. That's why you saved us, God. And we're so thankful. Thankful that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, that he went, and he went willingly, Lord, and, and he took our sin upon himself. You either accept that, or you'd pay for it yourself in a place called hell, which is an eternity of suffering and pain. There is no easy way out in hell. The only way out is through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, has saved a wretch like me. Uh, God, you're so gracious and merciful. Thank you so much. Thank you for everybody that's here. God, we need to hear from you today, so we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, open our eyes, that we may see wonderful things as we study your word together this morning here at the Narrow Gate Bible Church. Please use this study and bear much fruit with it to our lives and to any lives of those who may uh, catch this on YouTube and uh, the lives around the world, God. Please use it in a mighty way. But we give all glory and honor and praise to you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, so it is a great privilege that we have to be able to come together and to open the Word of God together this morning. A great privilege, a great honor. So we're going to continue in our study of last things and of the signs of the end times as found in Scripture. <clears throat> we're working through our passage in Matthew 24, uh, known as the Olivet Discourse, which is our Lord's very last sermon before he is betrayed unto his death. It is his very last discourse, very last sermon that he gives before his betrayal and before his death. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus lays it all out for us as a preview, if you will, of what we can expect to be, of what life will be like until his return when he will rule and reign right here in the, in the millennial kingdom for a period of 1,000 years, which will take place before the final rebellion and the destruction of all that we know, and the new heavens and the new earth will come, and we will enjoy eternity in the eternal state with the Lord. So, <clears throat> hallelujah, praise God. Obviously, we know that the rapture of the church happens uh, where he descends, not all the way down, and the dead in Christ rise and do what? Ascend, and we do what? Meet them in the air to meet the Lord where we go to be with the Lord. Uh, so, a totally different event. We dealt with that, so we dealt with that pretty in depth, but there's always more. We'll get to that in another time. So, now, this brings us to our passage of Scripture in Matthew 24. So let's go ahead, turn together in our passage of Matthew 24. And honestly, uh, we're just going to read verses, uh, I think we'll read verses uh, 3 through 5 right now, because really just we're dealing with this. So uh, Matthew 24, we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. And if you're there, let's get a hallelujah, praise God, amen, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Starting at verse 3, it says this. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and what will be the sign of the end of the age? Because as far as they knew, the destruction of the temple was the end. Was the end. Because Jesus came to rule and reign from there. So this didn't really fit well what he told them with their idea of last thing. So Jesus answered them, said to them, see to it that no one misleads you, or if you will, take heed that no one deceive you. Why? For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, 
and will mislead many, mislead many. So that's our passage we're dealing with, really. Deception is nothing new, nothing new. This has been going on since the very beginning when Satan deceived Eve into doubting God and eating from the tree which God said not to eat from. That is deception. Since sin entered in, there have been many deceivers and many who would claim to be the way to God or even be God. Many have given the title to themselves, pharaohs and Egypt and so on and so forth, that they were God's lowercase g. So this very answer that Jesus gives them assumes a couple things. But see, Jesus' is the very first answer to the disciples is not when these things will happen, but to take heed that they not be deceived. <clears throat> take heed, be aware that you not be caused to stray from the straight path, this path that Jesus laid out for them. So the very answer assumes a couple things. One, there will be a deception and people will be led astray from the truth into error, okay, right? <clears throat> we can get that from the text. Two, there will be also deceivers who will be doing the deceiving and the misleading of many astray into a false, pseudo-corrupt appearance of the truth, but will be saturated with error. Okay, this is what they're going to... Look, it's, hey man, this looks good, it sounds good. Hey, this, it's got to be true, right? It's coming from his mouth. Oh, and by the way, he's standing behind a pulpit, so I mean, look at all these people. All these people can't be wrong, can they? This has got to be true. Deceivers. All right? This is going to be a false, pseudo-corrupt appearance of the truth, but will be saturated with error. Saturated. <clears throat> Cyanide is what? How many percent? Five percent, I think? One, one to five percent? Poison? Ninety-five percent of it's good. But that one to five percent will kill you dead. Just a thought. So this is what Jesus warns of, deceivers who will be deceiving. The next verse tells us how this will happen. Verse 5, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. <clears throat> there will be deceivers deceiving many by claiming that they are the Christ, claiming that they are messiahs, if you will, deliverers, and, and, and uh, they will be offering themselves as the solution to the world's problems. Some will even claim to be Christ himself. The number of false Christs will increase as the end nears. Again, Jesus is laying out for us what we can expect <clears throat> during the last times for his return. Matthew 24, 11 says many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. So verse 5, for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and will mislead many. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Now turn over uh, there to verse 23 and 24 of Matthew 24 says this, Jesus tell him, then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or, oh, whoa, whoa, there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect, even the elect. And of course, we know that it's, you can't mislead the elect. We can, we can definitely fall, we've all fall short, but once they're the elect, that's what that means, the elect, the chosen of God. But dare I say, uh, just to drive this home by example, Jim Jones. Yeah. Dare I say, again, to drive this home by example, David Paresh, yeah. Waco, Texas. How about this? Dare I even say, go back a little further. How about this one? You ready for this? Joseph Smith. How about Charles Taze Russell, founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Society? How about uh, Ellen G. White and her clan of the Marxists, and, and all, not the Marxists, but uh, the, you know, they had uh, um, the Seven Day Adventists that claimed that, hey, Jesus is coming back, remember? And uh, what happened? They, they set dates, and then they had to, in order to stick with their Theology, if you will, they had to make stuff up. Well, he came back spiritually. Spiritually to establish the kingdom here. And we are that kingdom, which then, you know. So anyway, <clears throat> uh, by the way, if you get that wrong, you're headed to hell. So how many? 
We know that many false Christs and false prophets will come and they will mislead many. We know that, we know that, okay? We know that they will be cunning and very charismatic in their speech and in their presentation of a false gospel which promises heaven with no repentance of sin and with no desire at all for holiness, with no respect and reverence for the word of God, the true word of God, and they will make stuff up as they go. They will take, they will twist scripture and make it up. They will even create new translations that are perversions as the, uh, the, the Watchtower Society has done. These false teachers will also get, guess what? Eschatology wrong. The end times. Now, as we spoke before, prophecy is most clear by its fulfillment. Its fulfillment. So we read stuff now. We're not sure exactly how it's going to be fulfilled. But we see stuff that's going on today and we wonder, hey, maybe this is some sort of a you know, prophetic fulfillment. Well, yeah, it very well is. could be. All is under God's sovereign control, but you know, we're, we're, we're putting the pieces together as we go because it's, you know, nobody can be truly dogmatic about how the end will be other than we stick to the Scripture. We do our very best. Only God knows truly how it's going to all play out. Only God knows. So, you know, it's, it's um, hard to be mean and dogmatic about specific prophecies, especially concerning the return of Christ. We know that there will be certain things we know that, that will take place, and then Christ will come. So these false prophets will claim that he has come and is in certain places on earth. That's what they said. He is here. He is there. No, he's already come. You don't even know. He's come, and he's established his kingdom through us. We're the way. We're the real way. You have to go through us. You know, you could be saved, it's Christ, but you got to get baptized by us. We're the ones that have to baptize you. And then they'll say things like, well, God is one and only one. He doesn't exist in three. That's blasphemy. That's what they'll say. When yet we see clearly, and we're going to deal with that today, that God does exist as Trinity, uh, one and two and three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three and one. So, again, these false prophets will claim that he has come and is in certain places on earth, and others will claim that they are the Christ, as we saw a couple weeks ago, uh, the different guys that are saying, no, I am the Messiah, and you need to come to me. So these things Jesus warns of because many will be misled. We saw the one group was in the, what, millions. The guy claimed that he was Messiah. The Philippines, the guy over there in the Philippines, he claimed that he was the Messiah. He's got millions of followers. And it just blows your mind because you wonder how people can be so misled and so deceived and so gullible, so stupid. Can I tell you how? They do not take God at his word. All we did is read one, really, two passages of Scripture. Matthew 24, uh, 4 and 5. Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. What's that mean? Take heed, be aware, do not be misled. Why? For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. He even goes on further to say, As the lightning flashes from the east into the south and north into the west, so will this coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, he's not going to camp out in the Philippines in some retreat. Uh, uh, it's not what the Bible says. You are deceived. And this isn't to be mean. Our hearts should break for him. You know, please come out of that if this is you. So we know that these will come, and dare I say, are already here like never before in the history of mankind. They come as world religions, they come as cults, and they come as the occult. These people will come and mislead people. There are many, and they all claim to be the way or to be or have been the Messiah. They do this primarily, and you know what they attack most of all? The deity of Christ. They attack the very godhood of Jesus Christ and the very nature of Jesus Christ. That's where they attack. And this is nothing new. There's a group out there that was founded by a man who's a science fiction writer. He claims that Jesus was an implant that is named R6. You ever heard of that one? An implant named R6? He believes that an implant is a form of thought insertion similar to an engram, but done deliberately and with evil intent. It is an intentional installation of fixed ideas contra survival to what he calls the Thetan. 
He says that we're all thetans, right? And what's happened is we've been corrupted by these implants. And until we can be uncorrupted and get rid of these, these implants that are in us, that we're, we're, we're bound and we're not free, okay? We're thetans that have been corrupted with implants by alien races. This is what he says. This is what they teach. I'm not even kidding. So pretty much, according to this teaching... Jesus is nothing more than an implant that we are programmed with. And in order to be free, we must be brainwashed, literally have our brains washed or reprogrammed to get rid of this implant and then be free. We've got to get rid of these ideas. These things are negative. Apparently, those implants that were intentionally installed in us for evil reasons, by the way, so that we can get back to who we are really are and be free of past negativity, emotions and sensations, and be what we were currently in our prior lifetime, pure Satan. This is what he teaches. How's that, for, how's that sound? They're doing this now in China in concentration camps. They're taking the people that believe in Christ or Buddha or whatever, and they're brainwashing them to believe in the China Wow. Wow. Re-education. Re yeah, they're doing that now in uh, the workforce as well in, in different ways. So, so apparently, uh, this is what this group teaches. And uh, once again, I mean, this is founded by a guy who's not only a science fiction writer, also a medium, also a, a Satanist who, who was under the teachings of Aleister Crawley, who was partners with a guy by the name of Jack Parsons, who invented jet fuel. And by the way, this group is called Scientology. Scientology. This is what they teach. And you know what they attack there is the deity of Christ. No, we're, we're more than that. So notice their view on Jesus is, is this the biblical view of Jesus? Absolutely not. So to keep us here on the right track, by God's grace, uh, we're going to continue looking at who Jesus is. Of course, the Jesus of the Bible as is revealed in Scripture, not made up by some super satanic sci-fi writer who started a cult. By the way, that is a cult. And um, so the question that we were dealing with is uh, last week, remember we asked the question, who is Jesus? And we answered the question of, is Jesus God? And, of course, we answered yes. We looked at Scripture. Is Jesus God? So we looked at the names of God last week, and we saw in Scripture that Jesus has the same names of God. And we noticed that, that those names to be shared with Christ, He would have to be God because God does not share. Either that or, again, this whole book is wrong. This whole book is wrong. You can't get around. There's no in-between here. There's no gray area. There's no middle ground. It either is or it isn't. And this is the foundation of what we believe. So, Jesus Christ, we saw, possesses divine names, names that can only be used of God, of Yahweh, of Elohim. So, now as we get ready to go into our next <clears throat> phase of this, another sign, the first sign is that Jesus has the same names as God. All right, He is God. So, another sign that Jesus is God is that He possesses the attributes of God, the attributes, characteristics of God. And we're going to cover some of the attributes of Jesus Christ. Attributes such as His eternality. In other words, He existed before all things. His self-existence. In other words, He didn't need anything to be already what He is. He is not dependent. He is independent in and of Himself. Uh, his omnipresence, that is, everywhere present. His omniscience, that is, knows all things, Jesus does. Of course, we see exceptions, though, like in Philippians, of the very divine knowledge which he laid down willingly, willingly because of the Father's will, God's will for him. Therefore, wherefore Jesus was able to say concerning the day or hour, no one knows but what? the Father who is in heaven. Now, Jesus uh, willingly laid down certain knowledge in order to be in line with the Father's will. So, we're also going to look at His omnipotence, that is, He's all-powerful, His sovereignty, and then His sinlessness. 
his sinlessness. Now, we're going to get to two of these today, and uh, hopefully next week we'll be able to get more of them. Uh, But in order for Jesus to truly be God, there are specific characteristics known as attributes which Jesus must have possessed in order for his claims of deity to be true and in order for Holy Scripture to be true. Again, if Jesus is not God, you can just take this whole book and throw it out the window. It's really that simple. Being that these things are written in the Bible, they have to be true or the Bible is not true. And we are once again, guess what? The most of all men to be pitied and to be miserable. I mean, if Jesus didn't raise, rise from the dead, if Jesus is not God, we're, we're pitiful. I mean, we're pitiful. So the first point is this. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is eternal. The word eternal means everlasting. That is having no beginning and no end. Clearly, God is eternal. Turn over to Psalms 90. Psalms 90. Psalm 90, we're going to emphasis on verse 2. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You are God. So before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. This psalm tells us about God's eternality. Before anything was, God already was. He, was, he existed. He is eternal. Eternity past, eternity future. God is all and all, right? This psalm tells us about God's eternality. Humans measure everything by time, so it's hard for us to conceive something that is timeless since we were created in time, and in time we also die, right? Who has a birth date? It's a specific date in which you were born, right? It's clocked by what? Time. August 27, 1975, somewhere around 3 in the morning. That's the time I was born, right? That, that's it. I can clock it. Now, the time of my death, well, only God knows that. That's to come in the future. But again, clocked by what? We were brought forth in time that already existed because before the beginning began, God already was then in the beginning, when he created the beginning, you see time coming into to action, time. Okay, so there is time. He existed before time. So it's hard for us to fathom outside of time. All we know is time. Could you imagine eternity? You'll never wait for anything ever again. There is no time. What are you waiting for? Let's hurry up and get there. <laughs> I'm ready. Let's go. Could you imagine never having to wait for anything? It would just be like an eternal moment. There won't be need, you won't need one. You, you, we can't even fathom what existence will be like outside of time. Hey, you're late for work. No, I'm not. <laughs> How do you know? Because there is no time. There is no late. There is no early. There is this, everything is right. An eternal moment. In that. Can't even fathom because that, this is how God existed, Right? So again, humans measure everything by time, so it's hard for us to conceive something that is timeless since we were created in time, and in time we die. So for us to conceive something that had no beginning, but has always been and will continue forever, is quite difficult, quite difficult. Now we know that when we, go to, when we die, we'll be with him for all eternity. We get it, but we don't know what that is. Is there time in heaven and afterward? Well, that, that's still a debate that's going on and on and on. Um, it does say certain things that would assume something of that nature in Revelation, but we can't be dogmatic about it. Again, we don't know until we get there fully. We have Scripture. We, we lean on this. We rely on this. It's hard to fathom, though, uh, what it will be like. So anyway, <clears throat> it's difficult, okay? So the Bible simply starts with the words this. In the beginning, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, in the beginning, indicating that at the beginning of recorded time, God already was, right? He was the beginner. That is, God already had his being and was already in existence. From duration, as one guy writes, stretching backwards without limit to duration stretching forward without limit from eternal ages 
to eternal ages, God was and forever is. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? Now, Jesus Christ, God incarnate, also verified his deity and his eternality to the people of his day by declaring to them this, before Abraham was born, I am. I am. John 8, 58. Remember? Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. That is the, the, the short of Yahweh. That is, it is clear as we saw last week that this was one of Jesus' claims to deity, one of his claims that he is God in the flesh, both eternal and one in essence and nature, him and God, Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and of course, Holy Spirit. And if you recall, the reaction of the Jews, remember, what did they do? Turn, turn there with me, John 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 8. <clears throat> now, if this claim was just pfft, nonsense, there'd be absolutely no reason to be upset, would there? None at all, right? I mean, just like, <laughs> whatever, man. You know what? Believe what you want. Whatever. Ha ha. Get on. Go talk to those people, right? But that's not the case, is it? Verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Verse 59, Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, you know what they were doing here, the Jews? What the Jews were doing here, right, in this claim, Jesus claims his claim to date, he's claimed that he is God in the flesh, both eternal and one in essence in nature, right? Their reaction, what they were doing was implementing Leviticus 24.16. Leviticus 24.16. If you guys want to go ahead and turn there, go ahead and turn to Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. <clears throat> Leviticus 24.16 <clears throat> says this. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. Interesting, isn't it? The alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. In other words, inside, outside of the camp, whatever the case may be, who blaspheme the name of the Lord will be put to death, right? Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord, that is Yahweh, shall surely be put to death, right? And they shall pick up stones. And what did the Jews do? The Jews picked up stones to stone him because the Jews, because not the Jews, because Jesus was declaring himself to be the eternal Yahweh God Lord. The Jews sought to kill him by stoning, hence Leviticus 24, 16. And they accused him of blaspheming the name of Yahweh. Jesus was claiming to be eternal just as his father is eternal. But hey, it'd be one thing if his claim was just his, right? Okay, I get it, I get it. But there's many other claims. In fact, the Apostle John also declared this truth regarding the nature of Christ and his eternal existence. John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I'm going to do some turning today. Go ahead and turn to John 1, 1 with me. John chapter 1. We'll deal with this a little bit. Well, you can see it for yourself. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. Already, in the beginning with God, Right? Literally, this is what this says in the Greek. Before the beginning began, the Word already was. Before the beginning began, He was already there with the Father. Verse 2 drives that home. One guy writes this. The Word was, okay, so dealing with that phrase, the Word was, in the verse, in this verse, is an imperfect tense 
indicating continuous, ongoing existence. Not only past tense, present and future tense is what's going on here. When the time-space universe came into being, Christ already existed, already existed. Because what they try to do is they try to say, well, God created, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, blah, blah, blah. Then eons and eons and eons passed. And then he created Jesus. And Jesus is a lesser God than God. But he didn't exist beforehand, right? This is what they try to say, uh, and this is where a lot of cults uh, come in when they believe this, and even onenessism uh, does this as well. <clears throat> so one guy writes this, the word was in this very in this verse is an imperfect tense indicating continuous, ongoing existence. When the time-space universe came into being, Christ already existed. And dare I say, Jesus and his Father are one in essence. They exist from eternity to eternity. Already was. This is why, this is where we even get the idea of relationships from is because the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as one. This is why God is a relational God, is because in His nature, in essence, is relationship between Him, the Son, and the Spirit. All one, yet all individual, but all one. You can't separate them. They're all together. And, and in the incarnation came Jesus Jesus the Son, who came to do God's will. God did what only God could do and manifested himself in the person of Jesus Christ to perform the works that only God could perform in, in human. So, again, these, these are hard things, and I don't care how much you know about this subject, you can know every aspect of this subject. Still, it's, it's still received. We receive it by what the Word of God says, but also by faith. You know, this isn't something like Jesus never tried to prove his deity. All he said was, before Abraham was born, I am. What are you saying? He, didn't, he never just came out and said, I am God, period. He didn't have to. He never tried. He didn't have to. All right, so that's our first point. First point is that Jesus is eternal. Okay? He existed before all was. Before the beginning began, the word already was. Now, <clears throat> the second point is that Jesus is self-existent. Self-existent. <clears throat> this is what theologians call aseity. A-S-E-I-T-Y. Aseity. The aseity of God is his attribute of independent self-existence. Okay? God is the uncaused cause, right? We know cause and effect, right? For every cause, there's an effect, correct? So... What was the cause of God, right? God didn't need a cause. He is the uncaused cause. He already was. He existed before everything was. He is also the uncreated creator. God wasn't created, never was created. He is the creator, capital C. He is the source of all things, the one who originated everything and who sustains everything that exists already, okay? This put simply means that God is whom all people and things, trees, all life, find their source, existence, and continuance, right? Let me say that again. Simply put means God is whom all people find their source, existence, and continuance. And then you would say, well, what about the wicked? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Even the wicked, though they do not acknowledge God as God, nor do they give him glory. Romans 1, 20 and 21. They do not acknowledge him as God, nor do they give him glory. Although the Bible tells us that the, the, the rain falls on the righteous and the wicked altogether. The crops spring up for the righteous and the wicked altogether. This is what theologians call God's common grace. Why? Because all things find their sustenance, find their being in God. Okay, because he is self-existent, existed before all things, is not dependent upon anything, but we are dependent upon him. He is independent in and of himself, needs nothing from anybody. So if you think you deserve salvation, think again, because you don't. 
God does not need you, and he does not need me. I'm the last thing God needs. He doesn't need me. He's God. He doesn't need anything. It's a privilege to serve him. It's an honor to have him as my king and my Lord and my Savior. It is an honor to be his slave. It's a blessing. God is completely independent and has no need of anything or anyone. God is fully complete complete in and of himself and always has been. In fact, the very name, I am who I am, Yahweh, embodies the concept of God's eternality and immutability. That's just a big word for never changing. Never changing. He is immutable. He's eternal. That is, he is eternal. And that is, he is never changing. Both which are linked to his aseity. Aseity, which is that word that theologians use. But this is why Paul could write this. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 1.17. That's why Paul could write such great doxologies of praise. Oh, who knows the mind of God? Romans 11. What a great doxology. You, you couldn't even come to this conclusion unless you had an understanding of the character and the person of God and of Jesus Christ, of who he is. You'd never come to that conclusion because it doesn't make human sense. Okay, this is far beyond our reach. We trust in the scriptures. Okay, We trust what God says He revealed himself to us. He did so through this book right here. There is no other way. There is no other writings. There are no other books. This is it. Case closed. Canon closed. Now, Jesus Christ is self-existent. As the creator of all things, Christ himself must also be uncreator, uncreated, right? I didn't say it. We're going to do some more flipping. You still in John there? John chapter 1, in the beginning, before the beginning began, the Word already was. That's His existence. Now, where was the Word? The Word was with God. Presence. And the Word, what is the Word? The Word is God. Before the beginning began, Christ already existed Known as the Word, He was with God. As the Word, He is God. He was in the beginning with God. He was there when the beginning began because He was with God before the beginning began. All things, how many things? All things came into being through Him. Apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In other words, you either came into being through Christ or you don't exist. Even the wicked. Now, God is not the author of the wicked or evil, as we already know, but we know that all things that were created came through Christ, and Christ is sovereign over all of it. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. One guy writes this, Jesus Christ was God the Father's agent involved in creating everything in the universe. God created all things and did so by means of God the Son, the eternal self-existing one. Again, this is hard to wrap our minds around. But it's easy, you know why? Because we take God at his word and we go praise God God, maybe one day I'll fully understand this. Maybe one day when, when, when my eyes can see truly, when I'm removed from the presence of sin permanently, maybe then in glorification I will truly understand. But as for now, this is what the Bible says. This is what we teach. But it doesn't stop there. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1 now. Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians. <clears throat> chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> so, we're dealing with this. Jesus is self existent. As the creator of all things, Christ must also be uncreated, correct? Now we're dealing with his not only self existence, 
but his self-existence in creation. In other words, if he was not self-existent, that means he would have had been created. But we are looking at his creative attributes. As a self-existent one, he is creator. Okay, does that make sense? <clears throat> All right, Colossians 1.16. <clears throat> For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. If that's not enough, let's break it down a little more. Both in the heavens and the earth, that is, things that we can't even see because our telescopes don't even go that far, okay? Even beyond that, heavens, the earth, what we can see, feel, touch, smell, okay? Taste. <clears throat> For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible, what's that mean? That you can see it, and invisible. What's that mean? Whether you can see it or not, it was still created by him. <clears throat> Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. <clears throat> now, when we trace this language, we find this language in another place. Can anybody guess where? Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, dealing with spiritual warfare, correct? Correct. Thrones and dominions, principalities and powers, rulers and authorities. What's it dealing with? It's dealing with the, the, the dark world, right? It's dealing with our enemy, the accuser of the brethren. But what does this say? Who's in control? Who's in charge? That's right. Jesus Christ is. <clears throat> All things were created by him, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him. <clears throat> and for him. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Flip over to Hebrews. <clears throat> we'll just read 1 and 2. It says this, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, did what? In these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he did what? Made the world. Made the world. Being this the case, we know that Jesus Christ had to be the uncreated creator. This is more than just a matter of what we... of as we would think of when we think of the world, though, okay? What are we thinking of here? Right, we think of the world. What do you think of? As the world turns, you picture a globe, right? Think of the world when you see that. That's because that's 20th century thought. That's what we, where we gravitate to instantly. The world, you know? They, you know they didn't have TV and globes back then? Yeah. So the last thing they thought of was, dun, 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 as the world turns. That's not what came to mind with them. They didn't have these things yet. So, <clears throat> speaking of the world, that the world being made through him is more than just a matter as we would think of when we think of the world. Check this out. This can also be translated as the ages. The ages. It refers to time, space, energy, and matter. Now, you don't really get past the globe in your mind picture, do you? To a deeper thought of this, referring to time, space, energy, and matter, literally the entire universe and everything that makes it function. All was created by Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. All was created by Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. Interesting, is it? Being this the case, we know that Jesus Christ also had to be the uncreated creator, right? Verse 17 of Colossians. Colossians 1.17 <clears throat> Colossians 1 17 goes on to say this He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things hold together. Colossians 1 17 tells us that Christ is before all things. What's that? That's preeminence, that is primary, that is above all things, before all things, existed already, self existing one. He is before all things, and in him all things consist, all things are held together, all things sustain by him. He holds it all together, even now as we speak. You know, science has a hard time describing certain things. The atom, 
They have pictures of it, but nobody's actually ever seen one. You know that? That's why you don't ever see like a microscopic picture of, hey, look, here's an atom. Right? It's kind of speculation. You only see the colored ones, painted up ones, drawn ones. Because the true source that holds it all together is Christ. Christ. When the universe had its beginning, Christ already existed. Thus, by definition, he must be eternal. <clears throat> Micah 5.2 says this, But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. From the days of eternity. Of course, a messianic prophecy that speaks of eternal God's incarnation in the person of Jesus Christ. God is telling them that He's going to do what only He could do, and He Himself is going to go forth because He is from eternity, from long ago, from the days of eternity. He is going to come. He's going to go forth in the person of Jesus Christ, in the incarnation, as the person of Jesus Christ. He's going to go forth and be the Savior. John 1, 1 and 2, again, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. 1 John 1, 1. 1 John 1, 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested. Life was manifested. Revelation 22, 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, period. One guy writes this, his existence in the beginning, in the beginning was the word, this bespeaks his existence, not only before his incarnation, but before all time. The beginning of time in which all creatures were produced and brought into being found this eternal word in being. The world was from the beginning, but the word was in the beginning. Eternity is usually expressed by being before the foundation of the world. The eternity of God is so described in Psalm chapter 90, verse 2, again, before the mountains were brought forth, so the Word was in the beginning before the world had its beginning. He that was in the beginning never began, and therefore was ever, akronos is the word, krona is the word chronological. He was before, ever before, even any kind of chronological time or any time whatsoever. Without beginning of time, he already was and existed. This is one of the great mysteries of Scripture. Jesus Christ was not just some great teacher. He was a great teacher, but he was not just some great teacher. He was not just some prophet. He was not just someone with wisdom as a guru, right? Jesus Christ was definitely not some form of implant that we need to somehow get out of our thinking and mind so that we can be truly free. That's definitely not the case. Jesus is God. Jesus is the way, the only way. He is the truth, the only truth. And he is the life, the only life. Jesus is the living water. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the true vine. This is who Jesus is. The very claims of God, of Christ, of Scripture, of the law and the prophets, of the New Testament, of the apostles and of the Holy Spirit, who bears witness of the eternality of Christ in the world and in our lives, are all one needs to provide sufficient information of who Jesus Christ is. It's all right here in Scripture. Scripture bears witness. Holy Spirit bears witness. God bears witness. This is my Son 
with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And this is the same God who will give his glory to no man. So in order for this to be true, he had to be God. Otherwise, the Old Testament is null and void because it's a lie. This is who Jesus Christ is. So we made it through two. And I think it's worth taking the time to go through more as well. Looking more and more, what are we doing? We're just looking at Jesus Christ. And at a time like now, when the world has fallen apart, what a, there's no greater person, there's no greater one to look at, to look to, to have a complete understanding of as best as we can fathom so that we can share that with the lost, share that with those who have no hope because our hope is in Christ. Why? Because he is exactly who he claimed to be and he's exactly who God bears witness of and who the Holy Spirit bears witness of. And now the Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are sons of God and this is how we can understand this. This is how we are given understanding of who Christ is through his word and through the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and next week, again, we'll continue down this path of dealing with who Jesus Christ is before we get back on and, and deal with the wars and rumors of wars and so on and so forth. But again, if many false Christs are going to come and many false apostles are going to come and they're going to proclaim something, what they proclaim is going to mislead many, Right? Because people do not know Jesus Christ, although they say, yes, I'm a Christian, but yet they're sitting under this blasphemous teaching, under this horrific teaching of the day, under this name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, under this new apostolic reformation, under these people like Bethel Church, under these people like Hillsong Church, who sit right there on TV and say things like, well, you know, I'm not going to deal with that because, you know, I just think we should love everybody and love, 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 and they sit there and deny the very character of Jesus Christ. They deny the deity of Jesus Christ right there in public TV, and people go, but I love their music. You're a lover of Satan. You're a lover of the enemy. And there are people among there, unfortunately, uh, who are starving to death, and we pray for them that they would come out of that horrid. This is what's going on around us. And, uh, you know, we'll continue to uh, expose this this darkness, these false Christs and false apostles and fake phony pseudo uh, Christian groups as we go uh, down this path and down this study. But uh, uh, we'll pick up next week where we left off and um, let's go ahead and let's pray though. Father, we're so thankful that you give us your truth, that you give us your word, that you give us everything we need in Christ for life and godliness, God. You don't pull any punches, you tell it the way it is, Lord. Jesus told it the way it is, and uh, we're to do the same. We are to do the same. It'd be like knowing something that is detrimental and destructive to many, but yet because of the sake of peace or not wanting to cause problems, sitting and not saying a word, omitting it. Well, God knows. He'll deal with it. God, please let us never be passive when it comes to defense of the truth, God. Let us be prepared as your people that to go out there. But we're just so thankful that you give us so much about Jesus, about you, about your character, Lord. Help us to receive it by faith, God, and that they would change our lives, change everything about us, God. Help us to be those witnesses for you in these days, these last days, Lord, that we live in now, that things are getting worse. The whole world is frantic and panicking, uh, God. Help us to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, shining bright for you in these dark and dying days. Lord, so many people are hopeless. Help us to share the hope with them of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for everybody that's here today. God, we just ask that you would please bear much fruit with this study to our lives, these lives here that belong to you. We thank you for having your hand of protection upon us, God, and keeping us safe, and we just pray, God, that uh, you would continue to do so. And we pray for all the churches, Lord, the true church of Jesus Christ around the world. God, please keep them faithful and strong in you. And uh, God, please continue to, to provide for our needs. We praise you and pray all these things in Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.